So welcome, my name is Joe Turner and it's a pleasure to be able to speak to you today and to be part of the Connected Sociologies module. So I'm going to speak about family intimacy and migration. So it's a cliche that love is said to be without borders, but in places like the UK and many other European states, there's no fundamental right to be together with someone that you love or maintain social relations considered to be a family life if these ties cross international borders. Instead, state decisions are made over what constitutes a family, which can be the basis of settlement or movement. So this means that immigration controls often violently separate and exclude people based on not appearing to be the right kind of family. So this is one way that family and immigration are connected. But also perhaps less intuitively, we can see in our current moment how state borders are equally justified by appearing to uphold and protect things like family values. So in the lectures day, I want to make sense of some of these contradictions and tensions. And one of the things I want to tease out today is that who gets to be a family, or more precisely, accorded the social and political status that comes been to be recognised as a real family, is in imperial states like Britain, at least, always already imbued with colonial and racialized power. And this matters for how we understand the control of the movement of people today. So the key question that I'm going to, or key set of questions I'm going to address in this short lecture are, what is the relationship between family and immigration control in the UK? What is the role of colonialism in shaping these relationships? And how do we make sense of colonial legacies in today's border regimes? So in the context of the UK, the state uses a highly restrictive definition of what social relations count as family for the purpose of gaining rights to mobility and settlement. So take, for example, the family visa, which some of you may be aware of. So in order to apply as a partner or more often a spouse of a British citizen or someone with indefinite leave to remain, since 2012, there's been a salary threshold of £18,600, which the person based in the UK has to earn before they can sponsor an international partner to go and live with them. At the same time, the couple have to prove that they have what is deemed a sustaining and genuine relationship. And anyone who gets on this visa has no right to access the welfare state automatically and has to pay NHS surcharges for at least five years. This restricts the approach to family unification as shared in other areas of immigration law. So narrow definitions of family are used in the asylum system, which stops, for example, child asylum seekers from sponsoring their parents to join them in the UK. And also increasingly restrictive definitions of family are being used in other border sites. For example, Claims to family life are used to make judgments over whether people can be deported. The current Conservative government is attempting to end the very limited right that people subject to deportation have in terms of right to family life through changes or potential changes to the Human Rights Act. So whilst not exceptional in Europe, the UK still ranks as the worst supporter of family unification in terms of rich northern countries, according to the Global Migration Index. And these policies have created what activists call a crisis of separated families, with over 15,000 children thought to be affected by these policies, and many more of these in the asylum system. So firstly, it's worth recognising that at the heart of UK family immigration policy is a highly heteronormative conception of family, one that is also highly racialized. It's expressively heteronormative in that it only focuses on a nuclear definition of family and is fixated on an imaginary of monogamous marriage at the expense of a plurality of other relationships and dependencies and modes of care and intimacy. The family visa is also highly classed and patriarchal. So the salary threshold is over the minimum wage. So this inherently excludes swathes of British citizens from applying. And because of the gendered and racist structure of the labour market, this means that women, racialised minorities, and particularly women of colour, are much less likely to earn enough to sponsor an international partner and children. So through these types of policies, the Home Office is enabled to make judgments about what a supposed sustaining and genuine relationship and family is supposed to look like. And again, this relies on idealising certain forms of intimacy over others. 
So in this context, it's worth noting that increasingly narrow definitions of family were brought into UK immigration law with the express purpose of policing so-called sham marriages and actively weakening the rights of movements of diasporas, specifically from former British colonies. The family visa, for example, was brought in off the back of decades long discussions about the so-called failures of multiculturalism in Britain. And changes to the visa were said to be expressively about promoting integration. So as writers and activists like Amrit Wilson have for a long time argued, ideas about forced marriage in this period were weaponized through a period as if the state was protecting women through reforms such as this visa. And in public discourse, forced marriage is presented as a cultural practice in which South Asian and Muslim communities are made hyper visible. So this links up with wider Orientalist representations, often intensified through the war on terror, about the supposed hyper patriarchal character of Muslim gender relations and the so-called lack of integration of Bangladeshi and Pakistani women into British society. So family migration routes allowed, so the story goes, the living of parallel lives in Britain. And of course, these parallel lives are always imagined in cultural terms. The parallel lives of immense wealth and inequality are entirely acceptable, apparently. So these racialized logics central to the emergence of the family visa in its recent incarnation is also played out in the application of such policies. So we know, for example, that refusal rates differ dramatically depending on where a partner applies from. So, for example, after the most recent uh, changes were made to the visa in 2012, back in 2015, the refusal rates for partners from Pakistan was about, about 41 percent. That was in 49 percent from Nigeria. And as compared to the US and Canada, which are about 10 to 16 percent. So there are racialized wealth, geographical disparities in terms of who can apply and who is granted rights. But of course, such restrictions don't take place in a vacuum. They play a part in the broader raft of border policies and exclusionary violence that is the UK immigration system. So family migration routes are targeted because whilst overall the number of people traveling for family unification is small, it often leads to higher rates of settlement. So within state documents on family migration are always anxieties about changing demographics, particularly with a focus on the biological reproduction of racialized and migrant communities. And this feeds off long-standing anxieties about maintaining the whiteness of Britain. But whilst explicit eugenics and biological ideas of race might not be explicitly vocalized in policy circles today, these ideas are replicated in elite fixations on things like reproduction and fertility. And alongside this, we also need to place these restrictions in the specific histories of British colonialism, imperialism, and histories of dispossession. So now I'm gonna move out from some of these contemporary examples and further scrutinize the relationship between family and borders under British empire. So dominant practices of family in the West are deeply entwined with not only patriarchy, enforced heterosexuality and the demands of capitalism, but also the ideology and practices of colonialism. Decolonial feminists such as Maria Lagones argue that patriarchal conceptions of gender were a central facet of colonial power. And because of this, gender has always been racialized. Lagones demonstrates how indigenous and colonized peoples were frequently viewed as failing the strict model of gender relations that emerged in bourgeois households in Northern Europe. And this provided a justification for colonialism. Colonial projects were depicted as needing to civilize or teach colonized people how to live, including what families should look like and how men and women should behave. Equally, Evidence, for example, of socially accepted same-sex relationships, matriarchal social relations, or non-binary constructs of gender were taken as a sign of backwardsness and used as a justification of colonial conquest and violence. So we can see across the British Empire, 
how anthropologists and colonial administrators catalogue colonised peoples based on their imagined closeness to a European ideal of patriarchal and Christian marriage. So, for example, Asiatic Muslim marriage forms were viewed as too communal, whilst Brahmin marriage forms were cast as almost emulating European modes of intimacy. And at the same time, African marriage forms were frequently classed as too primitive, and this became a justification for the destruction of kinship ties through enslavement and the slave trade. So in this way, European and bourgeois conceptions of family were central to the projects of white supremacy. And in this way, bound up with racialization, dispossession and exploitation. And dominant concepts of family were from the beginning networked into border controls. From the outset, immigration controls were bound up with distinctions about who was a family and who wasn't, who could move with whom, under what conditions and for what purpose. So for example, we can trace the emergence of centralized state border controls to the regulation of indentured laborers who were coercively moved across the British empire in their millions. Often in the British case from India and China, and often to work in plantations from as far as Fiji, Southern Africa. The border controls placed on indentured labor was often justified in white settler states because of concerns about the proximity of Asian laborers to white women. And border controls were equally justified as apparently needed to distinguish between what different kinds of intimacies could be counted as family for the right to work and settle in particular states. So in the early 20th century, interviews, inspections, identification papers were all trialed to try and make sense of these judgments. And of course, because of the power relations of empire, states constantly used the codes of white Christian marriage and family to create judgments about who was a family, who was not, who could work, who could be deported, and so on and so forth. This, of course, links up with how immigration rules developed in imperial states such as Britain. So, for example, after immigration acts in the 60s and 70s, cut off Commonwealth citizens' right to move and settle, family migration routes became a key means for people to access their previously held rights to the imperial state and the wealth and services hoarded there, and to connect with diasporas, communities, and extended kinship ties as well. So consequently, limiting the right of family migration in Britain has since the 1960s been a coded way of restricting the mobility of people from former colonies. And this has sometimes happened subtly through immigration acts and sometimes through deeply interventionist and, and violent practices. So the most infamous example of this is probably the enforced virginity tests, which took place at Heathrow Airport in the mid 70s to check the supposed validity of Indian fiancés' rights to move to the UK. So how do we make sense of colonial legacies in border regimes today? Returning to some of my points that I've started with, and with some of these histories that I've mentioned in mind, I want to suggest that this works in at least two ways. So on one hand, we can see how examples of narrow restrictions of family in immigration policies work to actively control the movement of specific groups, such as through narrow heteronormative definitions of family, through salary thresholds, through the interrogation into the genuineness and sustainability of relationships. So in this context, the idea of who is a genuine family works to reproduce many of the colonial logics and assumptions around the supposed civilized or uncivilized family form that we saw emerging through empire. So we see this coded in the representation of Muslim families as being too patriarchal, or myths around South Asian women being unintegrated, or in the weaponization of forced marriage, etc. These policies then play a role in demobilizing people along what Du Bois called the global color line. For example, remember how refusal rates for family migration visas are higher from Nigeria and Pakistan than they are from, say, the US and Canada. On the other hand, family plays another role in the politics of immigration regimes today. And this is tied up with how immigration is racialized and sexualized more broadly. 
So for example, despite neoliberal restructuring, the British state is constantly rationalized as the ultimate militarized patriarchal protector. It's constructed as supposedly protecting genuine families and citizens against various racialized and sexualized threats, whether this be from gangs, terrorists, illegal migrants. Think here about how asylum seekers and people on the move are regularly depicted in gendered and sexualized terms. Child refugees, rather than being welcomed, are treated as burly lads or men, presented by the tabloid press and Tory MPs as dangers to schoolgirls rather than vulnerable people. Those making crossings in small boats across the English Channel to claim asylum are regularly presented as criminals, potential terrorists, or viewed as queue jumpers and benefit scroungers. The violent deportation of foreign national criminals to Jamaica, Nigeria and Vietnam is justified as protecting citizens and families against the presence of murderers, serious criminals and rapists. So as Gargi Bhattacharya and colleagues have recently argued, in this context, the British state is depicted as the true masculine protector against these threats and the only thing that is standing up for genuine family and family values. And all of this has material effects. So for example, the new Nationality and Borders Bill, which is the key piece of post-Brexit immigration legislation, will effectively do away with the asylum system in the UK, further criminalising the movement of people to claim refugee status and fast-tracking the deportation of people who arrive on UK shores, as well as experimenting with militarised and violent practices of pushback and offshoring in the English Channel. Part of the bill will bring in interventionist medical examinations to test the supposed validity of child refugees. And this is because so many Tory and right-wing Labour MPs and voters cannot see children racialized as black and brown as children, only dangerous threats. And parallel legislation will make it easier for judges to ignore the right of family life when making decisions about deporting people. So in depicting people as racialized and sexualized threats, this normalizes and makes acceptable state border violence, just as family life only becomes a possibility for certain social groups. And this again reproduces hierarchies around family and humanity, as I discussed earlier, which were first created under empire and are useful to differentiate people under contemporary capitalism today. Dispossession of violence is again levied at the bodies of people negatively racialized within colonial schemas of human worth and value. So what I've suggested here today is that in one capacity, immigration policies work to restrict certain forms of intimate social relations, causing separations, loss and pain. Certain forms of intimacy and kinship are deemed unworthy and disposable. But in other ways, ideas of family work politically to justify and actively naturalize this violence. And one of the results of this is that this creates even less social and political space to interrogate the imperial linkages that lead people to the UK in the first place. So in light of this, racist policies such as the family visa are legitimated because claims to family obscure the workings of race and racism. Elites who are bringing in more and more restrictive definitions of family can claim that this isn't about race. It's merely about who is a family and who isn't. So certain are they of who they know is counted as a family and who is not. But of course, as I've argued here today, who can be a family, who can be recognized as real love and real family has a history. It's never natural, but arranged through a specific history of Western colonialism and imperialism which continues today.